This is Hear Her Sports, the podcast by and about female athletes and other women in sport. I'm your host, Elizabeth Emery. This week, I was lucky enough to talk to the wonderful Gabriella Leon, a Team USA pole vaulter. Gabby and I met at the Katie Moon Pole Vault Classic in Olmsted Falls, Ohio on June 8th. As you will hear, it was a great event, super fun for spectators. The athletes were so close, it was amazing. I loved seeing all the action with my own eyes and discovering more about the sport. As you will hear in the episode, I was quite taken. If you have a chance to see pole vaulting in person, I highly, highly recommend it. There are often pole vault competitions in weird places like malls. The Katie Moon Classic took place a few weeks before the track and field Olympic trials in Eugene, Oregon, so it's no wonder that the trials are front and center in Gabby's mind and mine, and also a big part of our conversation. Unfortunately, Gabby did not make the team. She placed eighth with a height of 4.53. No worries, Gabby is young, and I predict an exciting, successful career for her. Gabby has already had great success at the University of Louisville, she was one of the most successful student athletes in the school's history. Gabby competed for the Cardinals from 2017 to 2022, finishing her career as the program record holder in both the indoor and outdoor women's pole vault. During her time competing for Louisville, Gabby was a four-time NCAA All-American, won two individual ACC championships, was recognized as All-ACC seven times, and earned U.S. Track and Field and Cross Country Coaches Association All-Academic Distinction twice while receiving All-ACC Academic Honors four times. And in 2022, Gabby won the NCAA Outdoor National Championships. That year, she also won numerous awards, including ACC Female Outdoor Field Scholar Athlete of the Year and ACC Track and Field Female Scholar Athlete of the Year. When she graduated, Gabby became a professional athlete sponsored by Puma. At the 2022 USATF Outdoor Championships, she placed fourth, earning a spot on Team USA for the World Championships, where she placed 12th. Her indoor personal best is 4.70, which she did this past February at the U.S. Indoor Track and Field Championships, earning her a bronze medal in the competition. In addition to talking about the Olympic trials and the Katie Moon Classic, Gabby shared a very cool story about calf cramps, mastering the mental aspect of sport, initially being scared of pole vaulting, the importance of a varied diet and of nutrition in general, and supporting herself as a pro athlete. It was an honor to have Gabby on the show right in the height of her season, so thank you to her for making time. Here she is. Well, hello, Gabby. Thanks so much for being here. I really appreciate it. We met at the press conference for Katie Moon Pole Vaulting Classic, and then I just got to watch you compete in the event. It was just awesome to see you pole vaulting. Thanks for being here. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm excited. And it was, the event was so great, and I learned so much. You know, like, what was it like for you? How was it for you? I mean, pole vault events like that are my favorite things, you know, where it's just a pole vault meet, and there's a huge crowd, there's loud music, And those are, I mean, those are just the funnest environments and, you know, competing with competitors who are also friends is also really fun. So for Katie putting on that meet, it was an awesome experience. The weather seemed weird to me that day. It was, you know, like hot at the beginning of the event when you guys were warming up and then it cooled off. How was it for you? Did you notice that? I think you noticed it because you started wearing warm up pants. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I did notice it was really hot at the beginning, especially because we're on a turf field. Um, so I was kind of happy when the clouds went out. But yeah, I like to wear pants or a blanket over my legs in between jumps when it's a little bit cooler just to stay warm. Uh, but I mean, it was it was great weather, good winds. It was it was a good day. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was a really good day. And and you said that there were a lot of people there. Like what kind of crowds do you normally get? There were a lot of people there for sure. Yeah, I mean, it depends. You know, some meets, you know, you probably get a couple hundred, if that, whereas other meets you get you know, 10, 15, 20,000. But this one with being just a pole vault meet and having the crowd right up, right up next to the runway, all in your ear, loud, clapping, cheering. Um, So it was just a little bit different. It was fun because, you know, the crowd was so close to the pole vaulting. Is Mm -hmm. that, I mean, that can't be normal. (laughs) Yeah, no, I mean, that's the thing with pole vault is for these street meets, you know, the crowd gets to be really close to the pole vaulters and 
we get to give fist bumps and high fives to, you know, kids hanging over the fence and whatnot at meets like this. So pretty much, yeah, just pole vault meets is when the crowd is that close. For me, I've never been to a live event and, you know, like to see how narrow the runway was and, you know, actually how tall you guys were jumping. It was pretty cool. Uh, what were your aims for the event? Well, it was, it was my last meet before trials for Olympic trials, which is next week. And my goal, honestly, was just to continue to just fine tune some things I've been working on. So just keeping speed through the takeoff. So just running fast in my run, which sounds obvious, but, you know, we got to remind ourselves of that cue sometimes and jumping up at the takeoff and moving my arms. So it was just some technical stuff I was working in, just trying to dial in cues before trials next week. And did you accomplish what you wanted to? Um, I would say we got a step closer. We figured out more what I need to work on in the next couple practices heading into trials. And we've certainly been working on that since that meet. But I mean, every day you learn something and get one step closer to where you want to be. One thing that was interesting to see was that a lot of coaches were there. And so after all the jumps, you know, the athlete would go over to the coach and you would look at film and, and sort of discuss the technique. Is that very typical? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you almost, I mean, you need someone at least, I don't want to say you need a coach at a meet because very rare can your coach go to all of your meets. Um, I mean, especially, you know, a lot of the vaulters, their coaches also coach at either a club or NCAA or whatnot. And so, and with us traveling so much, coaches can't always be at meets. Um, But anyway, regardless to say, you need at least someone taking a video of your jump to catch what we call a mid mark. A mid mark is three lefts out from the takeoff. And that can tell if we're going to take off on or off or under. And so just having video really helps us visualize and look at the jump and see what we need to fix for the next jump. And so the idea is that you're looking at this video and then you realize that you're not taking off at the right spot. And so you adjust it the next time. Yeah, it's a couple different. I mean, there's so many different factors. But yeah, if you're if you look at the video and you see your mid is under and that you're under, you might want to move your step back. But then we also look at technical cues. So at the takeoff, you know, are your hands up? Are you jumping up? Um, what's your body looking like in the air? What can you fix for the next jump? There's a lot of different things that the video helps with. And what are you thinking about as you're running down the runway? What do you call that? The runway? <laughs> yeah, the runway. Yeah, yeah. What, what are you thinking about? And I noticed a lot of the athletes were counting. I can't remember if you were counting, but I'm assuming you're counting your steps or strides. Yeah, uh, pretty much um, a lot of people do count their steps. I actually don't count my steps. I'm a visual. I don't know why. I, I do count my first three lefts because if my first three lefts, first six total steps, if those are consistent, then the rest of the run will be consistent. But I just think of three main cues. It's the first three left, so I count one, two, three, and then run as fast as you can. And then the third cue is get your arm up and jump up. Mm. And that's what I think about. <laughs> it's just I keep I try to keep it simple because when we overthink, bad things happen. So you just you really just gotta run as fast as you can, jump up. <laughs> right. <laughs> so the other thing I noticed when you were warming up, you put some tape on the runway. It, was that your takeoff spot or what spot was that? That was that's the mid mark. So oh. that, yeah, that's the mid mark for everyone. So a mid mark is, is three lefts out. That's typically when people's eyes begin to catch the box. The box is what you put the pole in and people can adjust, you know, they can see, oh, they're close and they might stutter their steps to take off on or they might stride to take off on if they're further out. But usually three lefts out, three lefts out is when people, people's eyes will catch the box and kind of adjust accordingly. So we don't want to just measure where we take off at. We want to measure three lefts out because that can give us a more accurate of what we might need to do with the next jump. Were you disappointed with your placing? Um, I wasn't disappointed with my placing. Um, honestly, I never care about placing except obviously at Olympic trials or U.S. nationals because top three makes a team. But other than that, I never care about placing. I just care about how high I jump. Um, do I wish I jumped higher? Yes, I wish I jumped higher. But again, <laughs> um, <laughs> there's always, there, I mean, there's always just so much to learn each meet and each meet just gets a little better for me, you know, as season goes on. And 
My coach was at the meet too, so that was really nice to have her at this meet. Will she go to trials? Yeah, she'll be at trials. Yep. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. So another thing, sorry to keep talking about the things that I noticed, but again, it was the first time I've ever been live to a pole vaulting event. There was so much going on. And one of the things I really enjoyed watching was the warm up. And you definitely have a very tight warm up routine, it seems. Like, could you describe what you're doing and, you know, like what you're aiming for during that period? Yeah. Um, so I just like to do kind of a general warm up first. So I have three parts to it. My first one is just kind of like a general get the legs moving. So that's just like some strides at about, you know, 70 to 80 ish percent. And then I usually like to do band exercises just to activate muscles. So I like to activate my glutes, hip flexors, core, and my shoulders just to, you know, get all those little muscles firing that main movements don't fire. And then I'll do sprint form drills, which is more of that quick, explosive work, getting those muscles even fired up ready for sprinting. And then I'll go on to do some dynamic stretching, uh, which is just stretching while moving around. I never do static stretching before I compete or do quick movements. And then I do build-ups, working my way up to 100% intensity. And then hop on the runway and do my warm-up there. And the way that the runway works for warm-up is that you just get in line and then you can do whatever you want on the runway and over the, over the bar? Yeah, yeah. So in warm-ups, we usually just put a bungee up. It eliminates the need to have to put the bar up for every single jump. And yeah, I mean, everyone has different different warm-ups that they like to do on the runway. I bet you get 10 pole vaulters, we're all going to be doing something different. Um, but yeah, I usually like to start off doing some short approach stuff, just really jumping up through the takeoff and moving my arms quickly. And then I'll get back to full approach and dial in the run. Usually do two to three jumps when full and then call the warm-ups and then get ready for competition. So another thing that I noticed was you did this, and I noticed a lot of the other athletes did it too, is sort of like a motion with your hand that's at the bottom of the pole, like a sort of a, I don't know, a jiggly motion. The pole was up in the air, your hands were, your lower hand was by your side, and then, you know, it sort of looked like you were, you know, in a marching band kind of thing, and then, but you were jiggling the pole, and then you sort of threw it. Like you took three steps and threw it or something like that? Oh, yeah. That's just like, yeah, that's like a walking a walking pole drop. So that just kind of helps me with the rhythm of the pole drop. Because when you're running with the pole in your hand, you don't want to still have it sticking straight up in the air when you're two lefts out from the back of the box and you can't drop it in time. So I just kind of do that to find the rhythm of dropping my pole with my steps going into the takeoff. So I just like to do a lot mm. of walking, walking plant drills is what we call them. Cool. Yeah. What's been the hardest thing for you to learn how to do with pole vault? Because it does, I mean, it, it was so clear to me what a technical sport it is. Yeah. I mean, that's been the hardest part for me is the, the technical side of it. I was able to get far very quickly in the sport because I have natural speed and naturally I'm able to jump up well at the takeoff but after that it's not super great <laughs> and we're still working on it it's it's got it's improved a lot but definitely my technical aspect after the takeoff is something that still has a lot of room to improve on so that's I mean that's exciting though you know stuff to improve on I like that <laughs> yeah yeah and so what does that require? Is that like core strength? Is it learning how to be in the air? Like, what are you doing in the air? Is that what you need to start thinking about? Yeah, well, that's the thing with pole vault is a lot of other things you can mimic in slow motion off the runway and, you know, different events or just in ours, like a walking pole drop versus having to sprint with a pole in our hand. But there's nothing really that fully mimics a pole vault jump off the runway. You know, so, I mean, it's it's just reps. You know, the strength is there. It's, you know, body awareness, reps, trial and error, and honestly, just, like, just time. You know, it's it's something that will just, you know, accumulate over the years with um, intentionality in my reps. You are still pretty young at the sport, I gather. Yeah, 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 I would say so. Getting older, I just turned 25, but... <laughs> Yeah, still pretty young. You know, a lot of a lot of people, especially female vaulters, I say, kind of figure it out in their later 20s, um, mm. typically. So, yes. How did you find the sport? 
So when I was in high school, I decided to join the track team my sophomore year. And my high school math teacher at the time was actually the pole vault coach. And when he found out I was joining the track team, um, I talked to him and I told him I want to be a high jumper. And I'm five foot four. And he said I was never going to be good. I was too short. And said I should try pole vault. And I was terrified. I did not want to do pole vaulting. I was so scared of it. Thought I was going to fall back on the runway. Um, but he kept asking me for weeks and I kept saying no. And one day I was like, fine. I'll do it, but if I hate it, never ask me again. <laughs> and then I tried it, and I I literally loved it the first day, and so here we are. <laughs> wow! But yeah. Why did you love it so much after, especially after all that anticipation? Well, I figured it it actually wasn't that scary, and I don't I don't know why I loved it so much. I mean, I've always loved sports and just activities. You know, growing up as a kid, I was on the scooter, I was on the little pogo stick thingy I was playing hopscotch I was doing all these different things playing soccer basketball t-ball all these different things and it was just a new thing to figure out and pole vault is something you can never get bored at because there's always something to figure out but I think yeah I think it's just it was just fun to just figure it out and get up in the air and go over bars so what is your training like it varies different points in the year. Do you want to know what it's like right yes, now? Yes, everything. Yes. Oh <laughs> sure. gosh. Okay. okay. No. So, if you if you need a limiter right now, but I'm afraid if you tell me wh- what's going on right now, you know, like you're preparing for the trials, which is so different from anything else that you've been doing. I would think. Um. I mean, it's pretty similar. I mean, the training, the periodization to peak is the same as you know in college. It was a conference championships or NCAAs that I was trained to peak at. So now it's just training to peak at something else that just means a little bit more than a conference meet right. <laughs> or NCAAs. Uh, but yeah, I mean, throughout the year, so I start, I take my off time very seriously. So obviously at the end of season, I take about four to six weeks completely off of any sport related activity, which is really, very, yes. Yeah. It's very important That's for me to awesome. get that mental time off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I still do stuff. So I'll rollerblade, I'll bike, I'll rock climb, you know, I'll go for a swim in the lake. Um, not an actual swim because I don't know how to actually swim, but more of a doggy paddle. But um, <laughs> anyway, just like fun stuff like that, hiking, walking, stuff I don't get to do during season. And then fall training is, you know, that's when we're building up that work capacity. So we're slowly lifting heavier throughout the weeks. We're running, we're jumping, you know, the body is really taking a toll during the fall, but it's preparing it for, you know, a season that lasts from January to potentially August or September. That's when we really build a super strong base is in those couple months in the fall slash early winter. Um, And then when season comes during the indoor, typically still going not hard, not as hard as fall, but harder than what we would do at the end of an outdoor season just because outdoor is what really matters. And then right now, uh, we just did a couple week training block just to kind of, you know, build work capacity in my body. So running, lifting, jumping, plyos, all those things. Um, but right now it's it's going to be light these next two, next two weeks. So just jumping twice a week with some short sprints after maybe a couple stadiums and some short explosive lifting. Um, so yeah, just really fine tuning making sure the body feels fresh. You mentioned your coach. Who is that coach and how did you connect with her? Yeah, um, she is actually my college coach. So I was with her for five years in college and now I'm with her after college. And she actually found me, it was funny, by the end of my senior year of high school, I was still not committed to a college and it was June. So college was two months later. And um, I had plans to go somewhere potentially. Uh, but it was actually New Balance Nationals. It was funny. In June, I had the worst meet of that entire year. But Brooke saw something in me, which is my coach now. She saw something in me, and she was like, this girl is going to be really good. I want her. Uh, which I think is ironic that it was a horrible meet for me, but she still wanted me. And we met up after the meet. I went on a visit to Louisville, and everything just felt so right. That feeling of just, this is this is where I'm meant to be at. And... So that's how we found each other. And it's been a great match. Yeah, that's great. And you continue to work with her now. 
That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. No, she's, she's awesome. I mean, I think a good coach is a lot of things, you know, not only does she know the sport so well and does she know periodization and training and everything, but she just understands all of her athletes as humans, you know, we're people first. She cares about our mental health. She cares about how we're doing in school. She cares about our families back at home. She cares about everything, you know, she cherishes all that. And she's also very intentional with each of us, you know, she doesn't coach me the same as she coaches, you know, her six or seven other athletes. We all get coached in an individual way, which I think is special. And what role will Brooke play at the trials? You said that she was going to be there. So like, how is she going to be involved? Um, I mean, she's, she's, she's a gamer too, when it shows up to these meets. Um, it, it's really fun when I'm on, uh, we can be really aggressive at meets and that's my favorite thing to be is when I'm on, then she really can coach me well. Um, but I mean, really the coach is, the coach is there to just, I mean, one, you know, give that comfort and confidence. And two, I mean, she, she knows me best. She knows my jump best. It's now six years we've been together and she knows what decisions to make. She knows when to tell me to move my step back six inches. She tells me where to put my standards, you know, if I should go up a pole, down a pole. Um, and now it's like I've kind of learned some of those things, too. So it's a little bit more of a conversation now. Um, but really, I mean, yeah, just just getting in game mode day of. What was the transition like from being in college and competing in that circuit and now moving to a pro? Yeah, um, I mean, so the, the transition from high school to college wasn't wasn't too tough. I mean, it was pretty smooth. Transition from collegiate to professional is is tough. I mean, I'm in my second year still, and I'm, I feel like I'm just still learning so much. I feel like I learn one thing, and then, boom, I'm learning another thing, and then I feel like I have it all figured out, and then there's another thing. Um, it's tough. It's more independent, definitely will say. But, I mean, there's just awesome opportunities. You know, in college, we got to travel around America, but being pro, you get to go over to Europe. You know, I was in Asia a couple months ago. And I mean, just being able to meet people and compete against people with all walks of life from all over the world. I mean, it's truly a special event or I mean, sport track and field in itself it really is. And how are you funding all of this? You have a contract with Puma. Yep. Yeah. So I have a contract with Puma and then USATF. So USA track and field also provides money for their athletes um, with certain tiers and then um, prize money as well. Oh, okay. What's the prize money like in, in pole vaulting? Uh, it's different. So bigger meets have more prize money. Smaller meets have less prize money. But I mean, when you compete at some number of meets throughout the year, it adds up. So I mean, it really depends, honestly, what meet you can be at. Do you have a part-time job or a full-time job? Um, so I work part-time, uh, not because I don't, I don't need the money, but um, it's just I have time, you know, doing just track is definitely a blessing, uh, but I do have extra time and wanted to pursue some other things. So I, I work part time with Fellowship of Christian Athletes, otherwise known as FCA, and they work with University of Louisville. So we work with the Louisville student athletes, and I just started that this year, and it's been really fun. Can you explain, so back to pole vaulting, can you explain the tactics of a meet because you know you can skip heights if you want you obviously have to make it within three jumps but you also have to be ready to jump at it you know like whenever your time comes up which seems like a hard to manage in terms of staying warmed up and ready to go yeah I mean it's it's different for every meet so some meets are super fast paced right like we only have eight girls in the competition and you're coming in an opening bar so it's pretty easy to stay warm. But for Olympic trials, for example, and next week, there's going to be 24 girls, but we'll be on two pits, but it's going to be a more slow moving meet. So, I mean, everyone's different. You know, some girls like to just sit down in between jumps. Uh, some girls like to just stand. I like to really move around. So when I wait a long time, I do like to do those walking pole drills that you saw me doing where I'm shooting my pole up in the air. Um, and then I also will do like some pull runs. So that's a full approach run. So 16 total steps while dropping the pull. And then, you know, it's just kind of like staying warm. So doing some A skips or some run, run jumps, things like that. 
Like, what happens if you're not warmed up properly? It just seems like it would be hard to do that properly. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, I would say, I mean, in high school at the beginning of my career, my high school coach did a really good job of instilling in the athletes to stay warm. And, you know, he would be like, he would, I remember when I was in my first year, so as a sophomore, he'd say, pay attention, pay attention to what these girls are doing. And I would see them like kind of warming up and moving around. And so I, I was taught pretty young, you know, not to just sit down and to be ready. But yeah, it just depends, you know, I mean, so if you come in at a higher bar, you know, and you have to wait over an hour, then you usually will get one warm up jump. But I mean, the consequences of not being warm is essentially your step not being on and your body just not being prepared to fire properly. Have you planned already sort of how you're going to tackle the Olympic trials because there are so many women and it's like such a huge format? Yeah, I kind of so... I kind of like to not think about it too much. Um, I kind of know how to handle like different meets at this point. You know, in college, we had a regional meet with 48 girls. Oh, wow. 24 girls on each pit. Yeah, or an ACC yeah. championship with 20 girls. Um, or NCAs two years ago is 24 of us. So, yeah, I mean, at this point, you know, we all have kind of experienced those meets that go super quick and also those meets that you know, go super slow. So we all kind of just know what works for each person. And Mm -hmm. yeah. So the other thing that I noticed at the Katie Moon event was that, you know, like your area, your athlete area is under a tent and you're all there together and easily you could hang out and chit chat and whatnot. But you definitely did a, I will call it a good job of sort of separating yourself and, and remaining focused was that a conscious decision? And do you have a way that you deal with your competitors? I know you said that you were friends, but you know, you are trying to do a really good job. Yeah. Yeah. That's one thing is, yeah, I'm a, I'm a very talkative, very talkative person outside. But as soon as that bar goes up, I pretty much like to just be in my own, in my own way. So yeah, I kind of, I don't purposely step away from others like I'm not trying to do that but that's just that's just what works for me I kind of just like to be in my own zone I don't really like to pay attention to who's making what bar or what someone's doing or x y and z I kind of just like to be in my own my own little place you said you didn't like to plan but you know we do have this big meet coming up and you know like I'm not trying to hype it up because you know in some ways yes it is just like any other meet but at the other extreme you know you get to go to Paris if you're in the top three so Like, how are you approaching that and how are you preparing? So number one is, you know, recovery. So nutrition, water, sleep, nutrition, water, sleep, you know, making sure I'm getting everything that my body needs um, to really recover, to feel mentally sharp and also physically sharp. Um, And then mentally just, I mean, for me, mental prep is huge. And again, I just, I like to keep it super simple. You know, it's, it's a big meet and it's a big team to make, but it's, it's just like any other meet, you know, if you just go out there and focus on the cues, I like to, you know, keep it super simple. So I focus on cues, push out of the back, those first three lefts, run as fast as I can, jump up at the takeoff and move my arms. And that's, I just like to keep it simple, you know. And try not to overthink, because I think when we get to overthink, you know, that's when things down spiral. (laughs) Right. Are you good at, I mean, it sounds like you've had a lot of practice and you are good at sort of getting rid of the external things that are happening around you, whether it's competitors or the crowds or all of that. Yeah, I would say, yeah, I would say definitely with the crowd, I've, I've never, I've never paid attention to the crowd or competitors. I'm not sure why, for some reason, whenever I'm in a meet mode, you know, for as long as I can remember, even when I was a little kid, you know, playing soccer on the field, I, the only voice I ever hear is my coach's voice. Like everything else just shuts out for me, which I'm really, I really enjoy that actually, because I think it would be a lot to think about everything else. But yeah, I mean, I've, I've met with a sports psychologist too for almost three years now, and she's been a huge game changer in my mental uh, I I would can 100% say I would not be where I am today without my sports psychologist because yeah like you said she's helped me 
eliminate any external things, you know, pressures or extrinsic motivations and things like that, um, that we've really worked through and game strategy leading up to meets and for meets. So now it's kind of less mindless for me with all the work I've been putting in for the last two and a half years. How did you end up deciding to go to a sports site? Um, <laughs> this is going to be an interesting story. Um, so during my five years of college, starting my freshman year, I actually started getting calf cramps at meets. It was my ACC championships was the first meet I got calf cramps at. And then I got them again at NCAAs when I was a freshman. And, you know, at first we were like, oh, it's just nutrition, it's hydration. And I was a little skeptical because I was always pretty good at nutrition and hydration, you know, pretty for, I mean, my whole life pretty much. But so for four years, I was still getting calf cramps and we were really drilling in on hydration and nutrition and I was still getting them. And by the end of my fourth year, I got them at the regional meet and I didn't qualify for NCAAs. And we realized, hold up, every time you get calf cramps, it's at a major meet. It's, I never get them at regular season meets. It would either be a, an ACC championship, a regional meet, or NCAAs is when I would get calf cramps. And my athletic trainer basically said, I think it's probably neural. I think you should see a sports psychologist. And at the time, I was like, no, like, I'm mentally strong, blah, blah, blah. And, but I met the sports psychologist anyway, and she was like, this is 100% nervous system related. Um, and that's how I started meeting with her. Um, but that's yeah. amazing. I love it. Yeah. I totally love it. Yeah. And I love how, you know, like, it's interesting that the sports psych said this is neural, not like, you know, it's psychosomatic or something, like, sort of blaming your brain or something like that yeah yeah and but what she said is it's nervous system related is she said I'm just the type of athlete that when a big meet comes on um that's a strength of mine is when a big meet comes on I I'm ready to go like I'm amped up and those are my best meets the biggest meets of the season are usually my best meets I don't want to like quote that and then be completely wrong 90 percent of the time when a big meet comes it's my best meets but then that also comes with the overstimulation of adrenaline in my nervous system. And we found when I get to a big meet and I'm fearful of not doing well, that's when I would get the calf cramps. But when I got to a big meet and I was confident in my training and hungry to compete, I wouldn't get calf cramps. So when I was fearful of competing, my body would tense up and we realized that's what stimulated the calf cramps. And it was like, it's scientifically proven, you know, in research that she's read about and studied. Obviously, it's her job to have done all that. But yeah, so it was like, it was really interesting. And it's definitely, it's something I still struggle with. Um, so far this year, we haven't gotten, I haven't gotten any calf cramps. This is my first season in six years that I haven't gotten calf cramps. Um, but it's definitely a, a worry of mine for trials. But again, for me, it's just, it's just keeping it simple and you know, focusing on just the, the cues that I can control. And that, that really helps not get them. That's an awesome story. So do, does she have, like, tactics for you to prepare, you know, like, to be not fearful, to be confident in, like, mental games that you're playing with yourself? I don't yeah. that makes it sound trivial. Sorry about that. I don't mean I don't mean no. that. Yeah, Men, no, no, mental no. Mental yeah. tactics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there, I mean, there's there's so many things that we've done. I mean, the first one we call it the triple A is we acknowledge, okay, this is a big meet. Of course, you know, my heart's going to be racing a little bit. Of course, I'm going to be breathing a little bit quicker. It's a big meet. It matters, you know? And so that's what we acknowledge. Instead of pushing the thoughts out, we accept it. Um, so that's, that's the second step is acknowledge, accept. So accepting, yes, it's normal to be feeling all of these things. You're supposed to, you're an athlete, you're competitive. You're going to feel a little different at a big meet. Soak it in. It's normal. We're all feeling like that. And then adjust is, okay, I've been training for months. I've accomplished X, Y, and Z. I know if I focus on A, B, C, D is going to happen. Um, so just keeping it simple. Again, that's, that, that's my cue I keep saying simple. Um, has really helped me. So that is like a mental strategy. But then a physical strategy is I work on breathing exercises. So I'll breathe in for four, hold two, breathe out for, hold two, breathe in for, 
And then lastly, another physical one is called lemon squeezers. So I squeeze my hands as tight as I can and then release and just relax my entire body. And that helps with just relaxing my nervous system. Um, and then uh, one more thing I do too leading up to meets is things that calm the nervous system. So listening to instrumental music, I like to color. That's really good for your nervous system. She said is coloring um, things that just are thoughtless. So it could be playing Sudoku or a board game or a fun conversation with a friend, just things that calm your nervous system down also have helped. That's amazing. Uh, you mentioned nutrition. So what are you doing about nutrition? Yeah, I think I think nutrition is huge. I mean, my whole life I've I've eaten pretty healthy, but I learned in high school I had some deficit in certain areas. Um, I never, never like to think of the word diet. I hate. I I just I'm not a huge diet because I think I think it's a lifestyle. It's you know eating foods that you enjoy. You know, so if you don't like a certain vegetable, I don't think someone should force themselves to eat it. You know, find a different vegetable you like or fruit or carb. Um, but I'm definitely big on getting in carbs, protein and veggies, you know, all the big and fats as well. Um, but really just eating clean. Um, I don't do it for looks, you know, I don't do it to look skinny or look lean. I do it because it, it physically, it makes my body feel better when I don't eat good. My body doesn't feel good. My mental feels foggy. Um, so I do it because it just makes me feel good, and I know it's going to help my performance. You mentioned discovering deficits. How did you discover that you had those deficits? Yeah, um, well, I, the first one is I got to college, and we got our blood work done. And my ferritin level, so that's your iron, essentially, mm, yeah. was at 6. So it was, like, borderline anemic. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I was missing a lot of um, iron sources. So, I mean, you get those from leafy greens, you get those from red meat, um, a lot of different things. But I still take an iron supplement to this day. It's pretty common in female athletes to have an iron deficiency. But, yeah, I would also just say, like, the array of food. I feel like I was eating more simple and less variable things when I was younger, whereas now I eat a lot of different kinds of vegetables, a lot of different kinds of fruits, a lot of different kinds of carbs, so grainy carbs and different fats and different meats, um, just, you know, diversity of the food. It seems like you know so much. Not all the athletes I speak to do. That's awesome. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it's a, I, I, I love nutrition. I took some classes when I was in college and also met with, I mean, because of my calf cramp thing, I was meeting with a nutritionist for all four years of college. So Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, I know a lot at this point. But I, I mean, it's awesome. I, I love nutrition because... I mean, it's, it's a game changer, you know, when, when you go to eating clean and healthy and then you try to eat unhealthy, you, you really feel it in your body. You, yeah. Do you eat sugar? Does clean mean no sugar, no cake? No. So I still do sugar right now. I'm not doing sugar leading up to trials. Cause I, again, I really just want my body to feel fresh um, and good, but no, I, I'm also a big fan of, um, I don't want to call them cheat days, but, um, What's the word? Just, I mean, if you if you want something, eat it. You know, if you want ice cream, have some ice cream. If you want pizza, I get pizza once a week. I love pizza. Um, you know, if you want that unhealthy snack, eat it. Just don't eat it, a big bowl of it every single day, you know? So, yeah. Right. So we've been talking a lot about the trials, but what happens after the trials? Yeah. Um, I mean, so hopefully I make the team <laughs> and then if I make the team, I'll definitely be preparing for, uh, the Olympics obviously in August. Um, but in July, regardless, there'll be some meets in Europe that I'm hoping to do. Um, I'm not entirely sure which ones yet, but for sure, you know, if I make the team, I will for sure be getting some training in and then hopefully some meets in Europe. And if I don't make the team, I'm still hoping to do some meets over in Europe. I, I just love competing over there. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. This has been really fantastic to talk to you. As I said, I've, I don't know that much about pole vaulting, although Katie Moon has been on the podcast a couple of times. So it's been great to talk yeah. to you. Yeah, she's awesome. Yeah, you too. Thank she you. She is awesome. She's great. Yeah. 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 Well, thanks again. It really has been a pleasure. And yeah, all of the you. luck for the trials. I'm excited to follow what happens there. Thank you. I appreciate it.
I love the pole vault. I just love it. I love the flying through the air part. I love the three attempts. I love all the different parts to the jump from running fast down the runway to being airbound with proper technique. I can't wait for the Olympics to watch Katie Moon, formerly Katie Najat, a twice former guest and generally a good friend of the pod. Thank you to Gabby. It was so great to talk to her. What a story of her calf cramp. Gabby is now in Europe, as she said she hoped to be. She just won her first meet as a pro, the FBK Games in Hengelo in the Netherlands, with a 4.62, an outdoor PB for her. It's very exciting. On our website, hearhersports.com, find all the Hear Her Sports Spotify playlists, images, and info about all of the guests who have been on the Hear Her Sports over the years, and to see how to support the show through Bookshop, Buy Me a Coffee, Lagoon Pillows, and of course by donating directly, which we always love. Thank you to each and every one of you for being here, spending your time with the show, and spreading the word about all these incredible, incredible athletes. Hear Her Sports is a member of Evergreen Podcasts. As always, I appreciate their support and yours. I just love being part of this community of women sports fans. Thank you for listening. I'll be back in two weeks. Bye-bye. Sports stars. They're like superheroes. But they're actually real. Which is why we've made a podcast about them. You see... They've all got a story. But too many of these stories were cut short. Kobe Bryant. Payne Stewart. Flo jo, Phil Hughes. Justin Fashionew. We're writing episodes about all of them. And sadly, many more. Death of a Sports Star. A new series from Crowd Network. <laughs>